Welcome to San Marcos Lutheran Church. We're glad you can join us today for our Palm Sunday, Passion Sunday worship. And we can't physically be together, but we are together in the spirit. It's good that we are here. If you would like to download a bulletin, a PDF of this service, you can go to our church website and there's a link to the PDF. Or simply uh, enjoy the worship as, as, as you can do through the songs, through the prayers, enjoy it and be a part of this great beginning of our great holy week. We thank you for your continued support, the gifts and offerings that are mailed into the church, as well as those gifts and offerings that come to us electronically. We do appreciate your support. God is good. Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on the colt the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on him, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he had entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. We praise you, O God, for redeeming the world through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Today he entered the holy city in triumph and was proclaimed Messiah and King by those who spread garments and branches along the way. Grant us grace to follow our Lord in the way of the cross, so that, joined to his death and resurrection, we enter into life with you through the same Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen.
suffered death on the cross. In your mercy, enable us to share in his obedience to your will, and in the glorious victory of his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 27th chapter. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So they released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified.
Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns in their crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head, they put the charge against him that read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derived him, saying, shaking their heads, saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him down, come down from the cross now, and then we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The bandits were crucified with him, also taunted him in the same way. Elijah. 
At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were watching over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly, this man was God's son. St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. Let the same mind be within you that which was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human likeness, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Today we're caught between two extremes. Palm Sunday and Passion Sunday, kind of a collision course. And we go between cheers and laughter to tears, joy to sorrow. It's confusing stuff, but this is where we are. Palm Sunday begins well, and then everything changes. And every year on Palm Passion Sunday, I find myself torn between the extremes. And it always feels unsettling. But this year, I feel that more than ever before. How about you? Truth be told, these are unsettling days for all of us. It's Palm Sunday. But today, we didn't have a crowd gathering outside on the patio as we normally do, raising our palm branches and shouting hosannas. How I long to hear the voices of children and young adults, the chatter, and then the older folks. We can never get people quiet when we start outside. I long for that. And then the singing. All glory, laud, and honor to you, Redeemer King. That's not to be right now. You are home where you should be today, sheltering in faith for the sake of the safety of yourself and the health of your neighbors. Yet the reality is it's still Palm Sunday, still Passion Sunday. This really is the day that the Lord has made. The love and the passion of God is as real as ever, and we need that love now more than ever. 
Today we see into the very heart of God and we catch a glimpse of what God is passionate about. Palm Sunday shows us who we are, people of good intentions, followers of Jesus. We want to do well, don't we? We want to be good disciples. We want to be part of that parade. Yeah. We want to do the right thing and believe the right thing. And we want to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. I want to follow you, Jesus. And on sunny days, on bright days, when we feel good, when the sun is shining and there voices are strong and our song is joined by others, it's not so hard then to follow Jesus. But what happens when the bottom falls out? Those times when our fears catch up with us and get the best of us as we wrestle with anxiety and pain and grief. No, then it's not so easy to follow Jesus, not so simple. And Jesus' final words from the cross that we just heard read may truly be our most honest question today. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you find yourself asking that question these days? I have. And Jesus did as well. Matthew writes that after speaking those words from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus cries out again in a loud voice. He breathes his last. And at that moment, the curtain in the temple is is ripped in two. The the holiest of holies now is exposed. And there's an earthquake and rocks split and tombs open. And when the Roman centurions, these Gentiles, see this, these things, they said, truly, this was God's son. And that's where our story ends for now. So what will be next in God's story? What will be next for your life and for mine? Wait and see. That's all we can do. We're told that. (laughs) But do we wait in hope, or do we wait in fear? Is it even possible for God's people to be scattered and yet shelter in faith as we wait? In God's story this Holy Week, we see what's at the center of all that we believe. And it's not a drama where characters are given scripts and they just act out their roles. This this is real. It's as real as life gets. Life and death. And it tells us about ourselves. It exposes us for who we are and exposes God for who God is. Because here we see into the very heart of God and it's about passion. Passion is tricky stuff. Passion can get us in trouble. You and I know that. What are you passionate about? We ask that question to one another, you know. And passion can lead us in good ways to live a real life, a life with meaning and consequences. But passion has its consequences. It's all there in this great and holy week, incredible mixture of feelings and emotions, and somehow in this collision course, our human passion and the passion of God, they they lead us to a cross. They lead God to a cross. That's the passion of God. The reading from Philippians is thought to be one of the earliest Christian hymns that was included in this letter. What that means is that Christians were singing this hymn very early after Jesus' death and resurrection. Almost 2,000 years. Those who were hiding from authorities sang this hymn because it was a a hymn of faith they they knew and it was important to their belief in what God was up to, God's passion. These Christians sang even when their faith was outlawed as Christians have been persecuted ever since Even so, they sang and they read these words, Let this mind be within you which was in Christ Jesus, who though was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. It's a better translation. But said he emptied himself, took on the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, 
humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death and at that, death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This upside-down God, this servant Messiah, Jesus emptying himself, it's not our natural way to do that. We think of ourselves first, right? Make sure we're safe. But that's not the way of God. Jesus rode into Jerusalem along with peasants following him, riding on a donkey, not on a, a white horse like the Romans would have, those in power, like Pilate's. And the powers in control with the religious officials cozying up with the Romans, they were more interested in preserving their privilege than their responsibility for the poor and the orphan and the widow. How was this nobody, this weak Palestinian preacher, a threat to them? Well, he was preaching good news to the poor, and it was a threat. Because Jesus proclaimed an upside-down dream of God, this world breaking through where the weak will be lifted up and the hungry fed and those in power will be brought down from their thrones. God shalom is coming into the world. That's what God is passionate about. This great and holy week I wonder, I wonder why all this messy passion stuff? Wasn't there any other way? Why did, did God let God's passion get the best of God? Why the cross? Why the murder of the innocent Jesus? Couldn't God have simply sent his son to forgive people and proclaim liberty and release and good news to the poor? Couldn't God simply have sent Jesus to teach about his kingdom? Your kingdom come, your will be done, and live a life of shalom and peace. Couldn't God simply have given Jesus a task of healing the the sick and feeding the hungry? The brute hard facts are that's what God did. He forgave sins with no strings attached. Jesus came breaking bread with the wrong kind of people. He hung around the tax collectors, lawbreakers, cheats, every kind of lowlife, not the kind of folks you want your kids to hang around. And he fed the hungry and he healed on the Sabbath and he didn't follow all of our little rules. So we murdered him. We nailed him to a cross. We executed him. That, they thought, was the final answer. And as we do that, we get caught in our own hypocrisy, our lies. We get caught in our passion for violence and war, caught in our worst fears, and even caught by our good intentions. We put God in a box, we lock God in the tomb, roll the stone closed safely against that opening, thinking we've done our best, our best to put an end to this kind of passion, but God would not have anything of that. Because passion gets the best of God. On the cross, God meets hate with love and keeps on loving. Violence is not the answer. God's answer is to love the world to death. God's power is made made known in weakness. That's the opposite of the world. It's the weak one dying on the cross who's the king, and those passing by insulted him, saying, If you are the Christ, come down. Save yourself. Then we'll believe that you are the Son of God. And of course, Jesus couldn't do that. He could not save himself because he was too busy saving you and me. Today, we see Jesus, the one we confess, die not in order to make it possible for God to love us, but rather to show us once and for all that God already does love us. And God's passionate love is her only lifeline. This is Jesus that we proclaim every day as the Messiah and Lord, the source of healing and hope. This is Jesus, the passion of God's action in the world, whose story comes to a climax this week in order that our stories will begin anew and afresh with the hope and the promise of a good end. So now there is no violence so grotesque that God cannot end it. There's no division between nations too great that God can't reconcile. There's no hunger so great 
that can't be overcome. There's no sin too shameful that God cannot forgive you. No hurt too deep that God cannot bear with you. No fear or illness that is too great for God. Because God is coming to save you. Even from death. Death has lost. Death will not and cannot have the last word. Because of Jesus. Because of Jesus, the passion of God grabs us. It gets us and they'll never let us go. This one, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but rather emptied himself. And took on the form of a servant and humbled himself and became obedient unto death and at that death on the cross. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is the Christ to the glory of God. Let us pray. Gracious God, a refuge in every danger to whom we turn in our distress, we sheltering now in faith pray. We pray, look with compassion, dear God, on the afflicted, Bring healing to the sick, peace to the dying, comfort to those who grieve, strength to health care workers, wisdom to our leaders, and the courage to reach out to our neighbors with your passionate love, so that together we may give glory to the name of Jesus. And we pray through the holy name of Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
the family of Rosemary Tangy, who entered eternal life this past week. May God comfort all who mourn with the hope of the resurrection. We pray. Lord, have mercy. We pray for our government and the governments around the world, that they will do what is best for the people, that they may be guided by your divine wisdom, mercy, kindness, and unity. We pray for all who are sick, in need, all those in grief. We pray for all health care providers, all first responders, all those who work to provide food, shelter, safety, and healing. We pray for all who are lonely, those who feel isolated, and those who are suffering psychologically from this, in this time of separation. We pray for your creative inspiration to meet their needs and our needs. And we pray, Lord, that your presence will surround them. We pray. Lord, have mercy. Merciful and gracious God, hear our prayers. Restore us to the joy of your salvation and uphold us with your Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
The God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The God of all grace bless you now and forever. Amen. Thank you. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. 